Forget predicted and unpredicted. Think desired and undesired. Okay, so I come walking in here, and I have this low-level desire, which is to make my way to my podium with the least amount of effort necessary. And I see that that chair is in the way, and it's mildly annoying. And so there's something undesired there. So the desired outcome produces positive emotion. It's promise. What's technically speaking? You could also think about it as hope. It's related to the attainment of a goal. It indicates the potential attainment of a goal. That's what hope is, or what promise is. Hope is, I can probably attain this goal. Promise is, promise is, if something is promising, it indicates to you that you can probably attain the goal. Or if someone makes a promise to you, then they're telling you that they're going to facilitate movement towards a goal. And so, that's the emotional level that the dopaminergic system works on. Again, it's promise or hope, or, or technically it's called incentive reward. That, that's the technical term. But it's the indication that something good is going to happen. Well, so when I see a clear pathway, then I know I can make my goal pretty efficiently. And so it's going to produce just a, well, it's going to produce enough positive emotion to make me walk forward. That's, that's the right amount. So, and so it's interesting. So you can actually use this when you're thinking about room design or house design it's like, so you're in a room you think, well, what am I going to use this room for? it's like, okay, you sort that out well, then you want to make the pathways to that use as clear and pristine as, as possible unless you want to put in some interesting variation just for, you know, decoration but fundamentally what you're trying to do is to set up the environment so that it facilitates the actions you intend to pursue there if you go into your room and it's all covered with stacks of paper and they're all messy you know, and, and you know, the bed isn't made and, and there's rubbish everywhere by your definition of rubbish then what you're doing basically is walking into a room of snakes and it's the same system that's responding to all of those undone things that would respond to snakes you know, not like a cobra that's right beside you but it's the same damn circuitry it's the circuitry that responds to chaos it's the, res it's the circuitry that responds to the dragon of chaos that makes you uncomfortable in a room like that it's, it's not explored territory, it's not a place where you can easily see the proper relationship between the tools and the obstacles it's not a place that you can make things irrelevant, not at all in fact it's a place full of obstacles well, how are you going to be comfortable in a room like that? it's full of things that get in the way of your goals you're going to be nervous in there all the time So. It's like it's full of envelopes that you haven't opened, and most of them have bad news in them. You're not going to be comfortable in a room like that. You think, well, can't you just ignore those envelopes? It's like, well, it's a stupid way of looking at it. So, promise produces hope slash pleasure, curiosity, all the incentive reward related emotions sort of fit in that box. And then undesired outcomes produce threat. They're threats, and they produce anxiety. But that's not even exactly right. <laughs> That's, in an elementary discussion of the role of comparator systems in the brain, which we'll talk about in more detail the general notion is, is that the violation of an expectation produces anxiety and that, that's a pretty good model and you, it, it's got some support from the psychophysiological, pharmacological literature because if you give animals anti-anxiety agents like benzodiazepines or alcohol or barbiturates they do respond less to the violation of quote expectancy it does dampen the response but, but it's an oversimplified model and to get understanding of human behavior correct you have to expand it a bit it isn't precisely that unpredicted outcome is a threat and it produces anxiety it's that unpredicted outcome makes the irrelevant relevant and it produces an undifferentiated emotional and motivational state it's a better way of thinking about it because it isn't just that you, you don't just get anxious for example if something goes wrong you get anxious, you get angry, you get curious you get frustrated, you get depressed like it's a whole bursting forward of emotions and motivational states and that's because when something doesn't work the way it's supposed to even when you just encounter an obstacle it means that you're, the way that you're construing the landscape is wrong in some manner and you don't exactly know what you're going to have to do in order to fix that unless it's a very trivial, trivial violation and you know, it's, it's one that you know immediately how to redress like if I'm, again 
So I come around the corner and I look at that chair and I'm annoyed because it's in the way You might think, well how annoyed should I get? And the answer should be something like Your annoyance should be in proportion to the amount of time and energy it will take to move that chair Right? Because that's kind of like a proper perception So, it's like, I should be that annoyed I should be annoyed enough so that I've indexed doing that because that does actually take some time and energy, and that actually has a cost and the fact that I have to pay that cost should be signified by something because otherwise I wouldn't be sensitive to costs and so, the annoyance, if it's in proportion to the effort is exactly indexed properly now, often, unfortunately, you don't know how to index so, you have an old car, you're driving to work someone bumps you from behind and then your car doesn't work it's like, well, how annoyed should you get? you don't know that's a problem, and so then all of a sudden a bunch of things that were irrelevant, which is the whole damn car poof, become relevant, plus you have to deal with this person that just ran into you and what are they like? well, they're stupid enough to run into you, so you don't know what else might be wrong with them and maybe they're going to be a bunch of trouble and you have to get their insurance information and now you're on the side of the road and you don't know if you're going to go to work and so, that's when your emotions can unravel, because they're trying to compute the effort and time you're going to have to take in order to rectify this and the span, the, 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 what would you call it, the domain that is opening up as a consequence of the problem isn't easy to map and so you get stressed and you go home and you say, I had a stressful day and the person says, what happened? well, someone hit me on the highway and they go, oh, that's terrible they figure that out, it's like, well, I was in this little map, it was only this long I was just going from here to here and all of a sudden, poof I didn't know where I was, or how many places I was going to have to wander around in before I could get that map working again, but the car is an invisible predicate of multiple potential future maps as well right, it's an axiom you make the map, presuming that you have the, the car, and the car isn't a metal thing with wheels the car is a conveyance for moving you from point A to point B and the fact that you have all these maps of moving from point A to B that are predicated on that conveyance means that when it turns into a car, instead of a conveyance poof, all those maps become extremely complicated as well and so your body goes, well, I'm, my landscape is way more complex than I thought up goes the heart rate, up goes the cortisol, all of that, right, and you're more paralyzed and you can, like if you're a neurotic person, let's say, something like that can just paralyze you, you're done you have to phone someone for emergency help, which means you're in a map that you cannot put your map back together you have to call on outside help in order to do it so and you might not even know how to do that ok, so that's another way, now, here's another way of thinking about it you want to stay inside this little map, because it's working you want to get from point A to point, a, point B, and this is good this indicates that you are moving forward that's the first thing it indicates and the second thing it indicates, which is even more important and you'll never hear this from behavioral psychologists is that your map is correct so every time you move a little bit forward and something that you want happens it says, oh, the game I'm playing is the right game and so, not only does the reward indicate progress it indicates that the frame within which progress is being calculated is the right frame and that's good, because it's the frame that makes things irrelevant and you want them to stay irrelevant so if you don't move forward and you start to question the frame, that's way worse than merely not moving forward you get a bad exam grade, what do you think? what the hell am I doing in university anyways? it's like, probably that's not the first place you should go with that piece of information and you think, well why? why is that worse? well, as far as I can tell your map of you as a university student is a comprehensive representation, it tells you what you should do every day it kind of tells you where you're going in the future and if something emerges as an anomaly, you get worse grade than you expected and you blow that whole map, it's like, okay, what have you been doing for the last four years? what kind of high school student were you? how clueless are you about how you're arranging your future? what's your identity going to be if you're not going to be a student? where are you going to end up in five years? it's like, so it's like a, that little grade, that bad grade is like a portal through which snakes can crawl and that's exactly how you respond to it, especially if you open the door too much well, maybe this means that I shouldn't be in university well, one of the rules is don't you want to you want to constrain the anomalous event to the minimal necessary domain it's really, really important, you want to do that when you're arguing with your partner which you'll do all the time we have an argument, 
well, I should never have married you. It's like, no, no, that's not the first response. That's a bad response. Or here's a really good one. You've always done that sort of thing. And you always will. It's like, oh, good, great. It's like, the only answer to that is to hit someone. Because, like, you're done, right? You're, you're like that. You've always been like that. There isn't a chance that you can be repaired, and none of it is acceptable. It's like the person's going to fight with you right away, because what else are they going to do? So what you want to do is you want to minimize, it, it isn't rationalization, you want to say, okay, this person did something that disrupted our joint map. Okay, what's the smallest possible thing they could do to put it back together? And you have to know. Well, um, we need to make a plan so you don't do it again. Or we need to have a discussion so that you know that it wasn't a good thing to do. But I'm not going to go after your whole character. I'm going to say, when I come home, and you're watching TV, just come to the door and say hello. Not, don't you love me? Or something like that. It's like, no, no, you just have to walk to the door and like give me a hug or something. And then that's good enough. And so then the other person might be able to tolerate that much corrective information. Maybe, if you're kind of nice about it, and you also understand that they're probably going to have something equally horrible to say about you in the next 15 minutes. Because you're going to do something stupid.